Hey, welcome to another episode of the Cullum Flynn Podcast. Today I'm talking to writer and author Emily Mays. Emily is from Canada, and after her mother passed away from cancer, it caused her to reevaluate her life. I was quick to identify the things that were not making me happy. It's such a great line you said to me when we were sitting in the coffee shop. You said that you were existing, existing not living. Not living. Yeah. Ultimately, making her leave her life in Toronto behind and follow her dream of living abroad. It was so empowering to do what I did and to just get on a plane and leave everything behind. And I was like, I know whatever happens, I'm not gonna have any regrets because I've also, I always believe fortune favors the bold. She started a new life in Rome as a writer, writing about love, loss, and grief. You start to put up a lot of walls around yourself and your heart. And you go, okay, whatever has the ability to hurt me, I'm not even going to touch. And in this podcast, we talk about her story and how life can be full of surprises. How to open your heart back up to love after loss. I was like, this totally took a different, a totally different turn than what I was originally thinking it was going to be. This is the Colin Flynn Podcast, and my guest today is Emily Mays. Her name is Emily Victoria Mays, oh and she is from, you sound American. Why do you have such an American accent? Everyone says that to me, and I think it's because I talk like a valley girl. Why do you talk like a valley girl? Not know. that there's anything wrong with valley girls. I don't know, but like, I feel like you can't really ask people why. There you go. I feel like. You can't ask people why they talk the way they talk. Like, you can't go up to an Italian and be like, why do you have an accent? Like, okay. it's just like, I feel like it's just part of like my voice. I started this podcast very badly then because I started by asking you, why do you talk the way you talk? Yeah, you but I mean it in a curious <laughs> way. I'm, I, I like your accent. I think you have a very beautiful accent, but I'm surprised because you're Canadian and it is very much an L.A., California. I know. But what's a Canadian accent? I feel like I don't, if I heard it, I don't think I would recognize it. But even you, you say, I feel like that's a very California thing to say, really? isn't it? I think using the word like a lot but using I feel is not really, I don't know. So Emily, this is, um, first of all, thanks for coming on this podcast because you're very gracious because when we met and we were talking and you have a fascinating story as we're about to get into, but you were telling me about it and all I was thinking of, because my, my mind is crazy, I'm just a crazy person. I was like, podcast, podcast, podcast. You're like, how do I sell this girl out? I was like, how do I ask How do I girl? monetize this girl? Yeah. <laughs> like, how do I not sound weird and say, do you want to come to my house and be on my podcast like next week? And <laughs> you very <laughs> like, trustingly yeah. said, yeah, okay. But your whole, okay, how you got from Canada, why you're here in Italy, I want to get into this uh, idea of a young person changing their life completely because of circumstances in their life. The work that you do now as an author and as a writer about, around grief, love and loss, we spoke for ages about this and the concept of time. You were saying so many profound things. I was like, podcast, podcast. Oh but gosh, okay, first of all, how long have you been in Rome? I think it's been over a year, just over a year. Oh, for, yeah. so you've been here for a while. Yeah. But you went back and forth a bit? Or? I did. So it was like 2021. It was like August and the borders had just started like reopening to, I think, Canadians to come to Italy. So I was like, Ugh, I need I need to get out. So originally I was supposed to come on a family vacation with my dad and my sister and then that didn't end up happening. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to go by myself, roam for four days. And if I hate it, like I'll come back. Mm. And then I ended up staying for like a month and a half. I was like, this is like, I just, I honestly felt like I walked into a storybook. And that's like the best way I can describe like those five weeks. And so then I left and then I came back. So you grew up in, was it Toronto? Yeah. Toronto. Yeah. A beautiful city in Canada. Mm hmm and you studied to become a teacher. Yes. And you did become a teacher? Yeah, I have my teaching For degree. elementary school or for high school? Elementary. And is that what you always wanted to do? No, I like never, honestly, I never wanted to be a teacher. Why did you study to become a teacher then? I think when I was growing up, my mom, and I think a lot of parents do this, they kind of drill like three professions into you. And it's like mm. doctor, lawyer, teacher. And you don't, be, 
you know, I feel like you don't really have that like creative leeway to yeah. choose anything else. <laughs> How do you think my parents? I was, I want to work <laughs> in television. They were like, well, I want to work in TV, yeah. mom and dad. They're like, you're, you're a lost cause. Yeah, they're like, you're not Brad Pitt. Like, who do you think you are? <laughs> they didn't say that, but thank you very Sorry. much. Emily, you said that. That's where you're meant to disagree with me and say, no, you were meant no, for this No, you're natural. Oh, uh, it doesn't count. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oof. I'm sorry, um, just tough work, Emily. But this this is interesting. So you went and you did the teaching because you were like, it's a safe job. It's secure. Yeah. And yes. You were living your life in Canada. Yeah. And then what happened? You, you were engaged? Not, were you engaged? No. You oh, my God. No. Long-term I was, boyfriend. <laughs> I had a long-term boyfriend. And I was in teacher's college. And during that year that I was in teacher's college, my mom got diagnosed, like, out of the blue with stage four cancer. Mm. So, you know... This was breast cancer, was it? No, it was appendix. Okay. And they misdiagnosed. Usually appendix, because it's really rare, They it's misdiagnosed as ovarian. So they went in to do surgery. And then we got a call, like, during surgery. And they were like, this is... Like, we haven't seen anything like this before ever. We can't operate, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, well, she probably has like, you know, four to six months to wow. live. So they they went through with the surgery. They opened her up yeah. and they looked and, and said... And they're like, this is not ovarian. This is uh, something else. Yeah. So the cancer had spread. Yeah. Um, Everywhere. And what age were you at the time? I, was, I would think I was 21 at the time. So what's it like when you're uh, 21 and you get that news that you're... Your mother, it was six months left. How do you plan out six months? It was the, I don't even know. Well, they said six months. She ended up living for two years. Oh, wow. Which is amazing. But I, I honestly have no idea, but I just started to like envision my life without her because I was like, I think that's the only rational thing to do. You know what I mean? She was my best friend. And she still is in so many different ways. And I thought, you know, like any child, you're like, my mom's going to be here for my wedding day. My mom's going to be here to help me like buy my like first condo. She'll be here for like X, Y, Z and like all those future events. Mm. And so I had to retrain my mind and like retrain the way that I was thinking about the future. And I was like, hey, Emily, like it's just going to be just you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you will not have that like mother figure in your life to rely on. Mm. So you kind of have to start figuring out how to use her own strength. And would you talk to her about that? Yes. Yeah, my mom was so good at that. My mom was not. Because no one is good at that. No. no but she, what I loved about the way that we dealt with that, me and her together, she was so realistic. She was like, listen, this is no this is the diagnosis this is the prognosis like i'm not gonna get any better there is probably like you know no miracle that's gonna cure this like stage four cancer that's like taken over my body and so we had so many good like open conversations about death and like what our what my life like would look like after mm. so that for me i think helped me so was much it, is it was was it not difficult to have those conversations? Oh or? my God, I was bawling my eyes out. Yeah. It was like horrendous and horrific. And I just remember it didn't feel real. I was like, this feels like a movie. Like you're having an out of body experience. Mm. Because you originally thought six months, which is a uh, goes by yeah, in the blink so of an eye. So you night. kind of always have to be, you, you're never fully in the moment because you're like, okay, it could be tomorrow. It could We're be limited in four, time. Yeah. We must do this. It's limited and time. Was your mother or your family thinking, oh, we must do this before the six months is up or do that? You know, mm -hmm. some people you hear... They rush things or like they... Or, or they yeah. make this list of we have to go here or there or, or other people just say we have to spend as much time together in the six months. When you know it's yeah. approaching, because most of us never know no. the day or the hour, no. but when you're given the timeline... It's tragic, but it's a very unique situation. Yeah, it was. We didn't really do anything big as a family. And where I look back at my life and I feel so grateful was that I was only in school like two, three days a week. So I had so much time just to like spend at home. And I would be the one like going with her to like chemo appointments just because I had like the more time and I didn't have like mm. a full-time job. Yeah. So my full-time job was essentially taking care of her. So I look back and I'm like, yeah, 
like you know from 21 to 23 I think I spent it like the majority of going to different hospitals and like watching her get chemotherapy and watching her go through all of this stuff now just to point out actually because at the start when I said we met in a coffee shop and you were telling me your story mm-hmm. and I kept thinking, podcast, podcast, podcast. Yeah. You didn't actually tell me this. No. I, I knew that your mother passed away, but I didn't know the details. What uh, I found fascinating was when we were talking about the concept of loss and grief mm-hmm. and um, dealing with the passing of time and uh, people's different people's per- perceptions yeah. of time and, and so on. But when she did pass away, it was after two years. Yeah you had this kind of moment of realization, did you? Or, or what made you want to change your life in Canada? Because it seemed like you had it all set up. Yeah. Apart from the tragedy yeah. with your mother, and thank God you had time to prepare for yeah. it and, and talk to her. Some yeah. people... A hundred percent. A loved one was taken yeah. like that. But so you somewhat were at peace with it when she passed? Yeah. Or was it still... I was really at peace with it. And I think at people who have been a caregiver to someone who is sick... There's a sadness, but almost such a relief Mm. at the same time because you watch someone like slowly deteriorate and it's someone who you love. And for me, one of the worst things ever was, you know, you get, she gets, she got so sick that like she couldn't keep anything down. Yeah. And for me and her, like our like morning routine, like we both have like our espresso together and we'd watch a show and that was like our thing forever and when she couldn't keep her espresso down i was like this is the worst like this is literally the worst thing yeah to watch because i was like that was our thing and now it's it's it's, you're watching it being taken away from you was she upset or did she put on a brave face or you know knowing that you and the family were seeing her in this stage of life I, she definitely put on a brave face, but she was the one. She was she was like, I'm going to like admit myself into palliative care because she's like, I don't want you guys to have to A, see me like this, and B, have the responsibility to take care of me. Was she philosophical about the, the whole thing? Was she thinking, why me? Was she thinking, well, why not me? She was angry in the beginning, as I think anyone would be, because mm. she was like, I just want more time with you guys. You was know she what young? I mean? She was 57. Oh, 57? Yeah, she, was she, young. Just, she had just retired. Wow. Yeah. The, isn't that amazing? Like the, the unfairness of it. Yep. But... Just retired. And, you know, her and my dad had all these like trips planned out. Mm. So that, I, I think she definitely leaned on her faith for sure but she never I, like I never saw her cry be like oh why me why me woe is me never yeah. never she was like a fighter through the whole thing when you say faith the catholic faith Christian, catholic faith yeah catholic faith that gave her comfort I think so we never really talked about it a lot but I know that she you know she had her rosaries she had oh. her pictures of saints and everything mm. so I I feel like it, it did provide her comfort so then when she passed what what I was getting at is that uh, you were somewhat prepared. Yeah. You had your job yeah. in the works. Yeah. You had your long term boyfriend. Yeah. And uh, Toronto's a beautiful city in Canada. <laughs> I, is it? I mean, I've been there a few times. It's, in the uh, summer, it's great. It's a summer. great place to be in the summer. But you decided then, I, I'm going to pack up everything, move to across the planet yeah. to Italy, and just start ditch the career. Just ditch the boyfriend, ditch the country. Ditch the boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> that's my Sorry favorite. If you're watching. No, my God. he's married now, so we really he's yeah. fine. <laughs> well let's not let's not identify him. So he's not married. His name is Franco and he's just after getting out of prison. But so why? Well, there is a big there's kind of like a big time lapse before I decided to move to Italy, but I think I time lapse when you were trying to figure things out yeah 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 it was about because I moved here when I was like 28 and I think my mom passed away when I was 23 so there's about five years that were kind of going on were you happy in those five years uh no (laughs) I think I was a disaster I think I was just on survival mode but I was quick to identify the things that were not making me happy and I knew that my long-term relationship was uh, the first. I was like, this has got to go. This is the first thing that has to go because this is not making me happy in any way. It wasn't going anywhere. Well, it was, but the problem 
with that relationship was I think and everybody has this like university college boyfriend or girlfriend or whoever and you're with them throughout university and then you kind of you graduate and you look back and you're like wait like what do we really have in common besides that we spent like four years yeah in undergrad together you kind of just get into a rhythm and a A rhythm and a routine right yeah it was it's such a great line you said to me when we were sitting in the coffee shop you said that you were what was it You, you tell me it was surviving not living or no, yes you said you were existing, existing not living not living yeah so when so many people that i talk to have that same feeling they just might not be able to yeah. verbalize it in that way yeah when did you realize that you were existing and not living i think for the probably i want to say like the first like year and a half up to two years of my mom passing away i was just kind of numb and i was trying to figure out okay like I'm newly single was living on my own kind of just you know like I was like throwing myself into like the single scene and like partying all the time and Mm. trying to just momentarily moment yeah momentary happiness yeah momentary happiness and I was like wait I deserve this I deserve to party like Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday Mm. I you know I deserve to go on these like shopping sprees and just do all these things to kind of like try to mask the issue try to put a band-aid on the issue i have so many friends uh, living in new york city living here in rome i was talking to one just the other night over a glass of wine and on the face of it they have an incredible job yeah and uh, they have this kind of beautiful life on social media but they were saying to me i'm actually like i'm I'm, miserable i'm unhappy yeah i'm unhappy all the time because of the job and this and that but to change a career is a, it's a difficult thing. Yeah. So what gave you the courage then to drop everything and move to Italy? I was still kind of like toying with the idea of like staying in Toronto and like working in marketing. But what happened when I took that digital marketing course, I just fell in love with writing. So I was like, okay, whatever I can do in my job that can tie in writing and social media just kind of happened to be huge at the time and still is I was like okay like this is like something that I need to do so I was writing I had my blog I ended up getting a job at like a crypto marketing agency okay that was like my first social media full-time job and then COVID happened (laughs) and it went under so that was in Canada that was in Canada yeah. yeah and so I was there for six months we all got laid off and then I started to freelance. I was like, okay. You were like, this is what happens when you take a chance this, in life. This is what happens when I take a chance <laughs> yeah. and like work for the man, a essentially. Global, like, a global <laughs> pandemic yeah. breaks out. You lose your job. You're in a worse place. Yeah. So the moral of the story is stay in the secure study job, even if you're miserable. Well, it, <laughs> right? So when you got on the plane, a sense of adventure, sen- yeah. a sense of fear. Yeah. And I remember texting my friend who had like moved to London and I was like, is this crazy? Like, should I be doing this? And I saw the screenshot and she was like, your mom has you, don't worry. And I was mm. like, okay. Did you sense, did you feel that your mother was looking after you? I I couldn't sense it at the time, but I just was like, I, like, I can't describe it. I was like, I just feel like it was so empowering to do what I did and to just get on a plane and leave everything behind. And I was like, I know whatever happens, I'm not gonna have any regrets because I've also, I always believe fortune favors the bold, so. Fortune favors the bold. That is true. Right. When you arrived in Italy, you thought this is a dream because it's a well-organized country. Everything <laughs> Everything works. Everything works. <laughs> everything runs smoothly. <laughs> Nothing ever goes wrong. Nothing, there's no chaos, it's so calm. It. You go to an office, you get what you need there and then straight away. Efficiency yep. is the name of the game. Hundred percent. So, did you find it difficult adjusting to Italian life? Um, yes. Trying to get the apartment, trying to get set up with the phone, this and that. The apartment was a nightmare. I told my friend, I was like, "Listen, I've like been through things. I'm like, I think this is one of the worst things that I've ever had to well, do in my be- life." Before I moved into this <laughs> nice apartment, there's an apartment down the street I wanted to take, and the landlord wanted the entire year. And four months rent up front. Are you kidding 23, me? 23,000 or something they wanted. But I've heard that. It's they wanted 23,000 up front. And this is something you have to be careful of when you come to Rome. Because yeah. not everyone, of course, there are wonderful right. people here. 
but there are those who they take advantage they take advantage yeah. big time yeah and that's the biggest thing i think people in north america we romanticize living in europe yeah right and it's I've, not all romantic no it's not and people look at it they're like oh the dolce vita like blah 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 and i'm like no like you especially as a young girl you really need to be like on your game mm. all the time the stereotype of a beautiful american girl walking down the street and ciao bella you know is it true um yes and no i feel like first of all i like have a hearing problem because i turn on my headphones so loud so i feel like i can't hear anything anymore i kind of have just tuned everything out <laughs> because you you wear your headphones too i loud. wear them so loud you've damaged your hearing irreversibly. i think so i'm pretty sure i did i'm pretty sure i have like that whatever that word is like tiny tinnitus or whatever tinnitus yes okay <laughs> and i hear uh, someone on the street go hey beautiful whoever it's for i just turn around You're thank like, you thank you so much i go thank you so much <laughs> And have a great day. Yeah. <laughs> but it's um, it's just a fascinating life. Now, we don't want to paint it uh, in a bad light. It no, never. It is a beautiful city yeah. to live in. Yeah. It's, it is a dream in yeah, many respects. it is, 100%. And did you feel that like you were living a fairy tale? Yes. Oh my gosh, when I first, I think any any person who moves to Rome, because it, honestly, I really do believe it's probably one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Mm. But you have these like rose colored lenses on, right? Of course. And you're like, you go around and you're like, oh my God, like the Colosseum, like it's like history is like right here. You're eating the best food all the time. Like you're walking, you're fit, you're glowing and you're like, oh my God, I can like drink a bottle of wine and not be hungover. Like it's a totally different world than what we are used to or what I was used to back home. But was your plan, Emily, to settle down like as in get a, some sort of job here in Italy and get an apartment and then like set up your life here? I Or did you not know? I had no idea. My visa was for a year and I, because I'm my own boss, I can work from anywhere. So I yeah. always like I had my clients, right? I had steady work coming so in. Your clients now, you do what for them? So so I do social media marketing and I also do content writing. Now, I meet so many people here in Rome mm-hmm. who do social media marketing and content. Mm-hmm. Is there enough work to go around for everybody? Um, i not sure about in Italy or in Rome specifically. Your clients are back in the U.S. Yes. Or they're, in the Canada. They're Canada and the U.S. The salaries here. Very low. Very low. Very, very being low. Being rock bottom. Yeah. So if, you're go- if someone is thinking of moving here, they need to come on a salary from another country. Yeah. Otherwise, it's very be, hard to live. My advice is always be your own boss. And if you want, work here part time or just, you know, because you're full, the full time, I think, what is it? The full time salary, like a good salary is like 1200 euros a month. I could be wrong on that. No, a good salary here is 12 to 1500 a month. And that's like maybe in your 30s or 40s established with the, I have a friend who's an architect here and she has a master's and she's been paid 800 a month and her rent is 600 a month. So oh, wow, math. that's a good How, how <laughs> do you? Month is good for it's good, but it's a bit outside the city, you know? And it's a room sharing with other people. But then, you know, you've got to pay your bills on top of that. You're living. It's it's a very tough place. And that's why yes. your inheritance is a big thing. Yeah. People get a, an apartment from their grandparents. Yes, or yeah. They live yes. at home. They the stereotype at home, 100%. of uh, the Italian man yeah. living at well, home with his mother. A hundred percent. I mean, it's. I think it's all real. What ended up happening was I... So I started a newsletter last February before I came like back here officially and you know living like my best like single life and all of a sudden (laughs) I turned into like the stereotypical girl who comes to Italy and I was like I think I fell in love that's why I swore (laughs) I was like I think (laughs) we'll beat that I said I've fallen for Fabio I felt I fell for Fabio. His name I isn't did. Fabio. And I no. And I fought it for a really long time. How I, did you meet Fabio? Um, I met him out. I won't I can't divulge too many details because Ooh, why was it a wine bar? Was <laughs> no, it? it wasn't a wine bar. It was a bar. I met him at a bar. You met him at a bar. Yeah. Okay. Is that the truth or is that? Yeah, no, that's the truth. That's the truth. It is. So you met Fabio at a bar mm-hmm. and he told Dark Handsome uh, Yeah. <laughs> and was he like jackpot here's an american after walking in <laughs> no i honestly think that everything oh it just started out very friendly and when it changed was when he was like well like what do you like to write about and i was like mm, grief death love loss 
And it was so funny because whenever a guy back at home like would ask me that question, I would totally avoid it. I'd be like, oh, I'm a travel writer. Like I like to write about like food, upcoming restaurants in Toronto. I would never say, oh, I love writing about death. I would love writing about loss. But here it was different. And now I feel like I lead with that because it's just now it's now I like accept it more. So you bonded over that, the two of you. Mm -hmm. And you talked about that. And then how long did you date for? Well, we didn't date. You didn't date? <laughs> no. Now, hang on a second. We didn't date. I would not We've use... We've seen each other. We, yeah, like, it was a very short, brief romance, but one that, like, really... Intense. Yeah, and it really, really impacted me. In what way? Just, you know, I think, and I was talking to this, uh, talking about this with my friend the other day, I think when you go through grief and when you go through loss when you lose someone Mm. you start to put up a lot of walls around yourself and your heart and you go okay whatever has the ability to hurt me I'm not even gonna touch I'm not even going to like entertain so like for five years like I didn't really entertain like love or romance like I was just kind of like I was having fun you know like it was like fling after fling after fling because I didn't want to get hurt. But ultimately unfulfilling. Yeah, 100%. I, I'm, I'm asking, yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was yeah. unfulfilling for sure. And, you know, then I met this guy and all of a sudden, like, I remember the first day that me and him hung out, I called my friend and I started bawling. I was like, I don't know what's happening to me. Like, I like cannot like, explain I'm it. In love. I was, no, I didn't even say I was in love. I was just like, I feel like I've like lost control. Like, I feel like I can't you know keep hiding behind these walls anymore like i think like something is just like coming undone (laughs) so it it sounds but like that sounds great yeah (laughs) and he fabio is nice italian man you've set up your life um i'm not gonna ask because it's too nosy but i know the folks watching or listening might want to know so i'll reluctantly ask on their behalf what happened you know it there were many factors to the situation as to why it wasn't going to go anywhere. You're tiptoeing around something. Here. Yeah. Many factors yes. means there was one factor. Uh, many. <laughs> there wasn't there many, many factors. Okay, there were well there were a few factors. We'll skip it. Fabio's gone to the side. Yeah. So you are here writing about and this is what I think is so interesting because you meet a lot of people here mm-hmm. in coffee shops who are social media influencers or marketers but they and writers but you write about love yeah loss and grief yeah now you were saying to me that those three are all intertwined in one yes i really believe it oh my gosh i kind of love this question so much because i feel like i just figured out the answer a few days ago and i think it's because it's two emotions where it's you you lose control you i don't believe in this life we choose who we fall for or that we fall in love with I think it just happens just like we can't control death right just like I couldn't control like my mom's diagnosis Mm. and just like I feel like I couldn't have controlled the way that I felt about Fabio about the guy when you felt crazy and yeah 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 yeah. that's interesting so you're saying you write about these things because they're the three things that most of us experience Mm -hmm. at different stages of our life Mm -hmm. but they're the three things we can't plan for no. Or control. No. Because if you like something, yeah, you can go towards the things you like. Yeah. It'll make you feel good. If something makes you sad, you know that feeling, you know, to avoid things. But love, loss and grief yeah, are things we can't that avoid will, it. They will hit you. Yeah. And isn't it crazy that they're so fundamental to who we are mm-hmm. as people and the human experience that and they're bound to happen and we know that they will be uh, make us go crazy yeah. if we're crazy in love make put a stone in our soul if it's the loss of someone but growing up we're never taught to really talk about them or how how to deal with them express them which is really interesting and i think that's why you write about it yeah because it's a way for me my gemini mind i need to make sense of everything and like figure out why i'm feeling the way that i'm feeling when you write about something like grief and loss like, what are you writing about? What point are you coming from? Or, or what are you exploring? What are you discovering? I think I'm always, honestly, as cheesy as it sounds, I'm always writing from my heart. Like, always. And I think that's why my writing does really well and it hits a lot of people because it's 
all out of experience and it's all out of honesty. I don't sit and like pretend to be someone else. I don't sit here being like, oh, I'm a grief expert. You should do this. Or like, let me give you like, you know, unsolicited relationship advice. I am more so like very in my feelings. I feel like it's very personal. It's like almost like reading somebody's like diary. Mm. But I find like that's where we all connect more. Like it's like our innermost thoughts. What have you learned yourself from writing about the subjects of love, loss and grief? What has surprised oh you? What have you discovered? Well, you know what's so interesting? Okay, I'm plugging myself right now. When I wrote my book. Oh yeah, your book. We haven't mentioned your book. <laughs> we yet. haven't. This it was in the intro, freak. but just remind you, you wrote a book. When I wrote Failing Gracefully, <laughs> I had this idea in my head and I was like, okay, it's going to be all of my like favorite little like short essays and poems and newsletters that I have had written over the years. And it's going to be, you know, the overarching themes of death and loss and grief and like how to, you know, how to deal with it, how to like kind of like love yourself a Mm. little bit more during it after I ended up putting everything together and I read it and I was like, no, 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 this is like how to open your heart back up to love after loss. I was like, this totally took a different a totally different turn than what I was originally thinking it was going to be. Because when you had such a loss in your life, your probably heart and soul is so damaged. Yeah. You don't want anything that will jeopardize or put you in that position again. In harm's way yeah. again. So yeah. your, your guard is just up. But what I love so much about it is that it starts off, and I always wanted to have it start off this way. I wrote a piece about like, you know, my mom being in palliative care. Mm. And so that's how Failing Gracefully starts. And then it ends with a piece, you know, inspired by Fabio. And the line goes, um, like the last line in the book is like, I'm starting to believe in something. And that's kind of what I wanted people to take away from all of it is that, yeah, you can go through trauma, you can watch someone die, you can go through like the hardest things, but there's always A, a lesson in it, and you can, there's always something to believe in, Mm. you know? It's hard to see that at the time, probably, when you're engulfed in grief. Yeah, 100%, and I think it took me like six years to realize that. Isn't it interesting that it took you, Emily, six years to realize that, Mm -hmm. and you had the time to prepare with your mother, and you spoke to your mother about it. For for people who, um, and I meet them all the time through work, through interviews, people who lose someone unexpectedly in a plane crash or some tragic event where you don't have that time to say goodbye. I mean, that... getting over something like that, that grief. Yeah. So how are you doing today, by the way, with your your mother and your grief? I know it's been a few years, but still. Oh my gosh. I think that I am probably doing the best that I have ever done, (laughs) that I've ever been. You don't regret changing your life and moving to Italy? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I remember I had called one of my friends a few months ago because I was just, you know, these Italian men really are breaking my heart a little bit. And I was crying and she was like, yeah, but, and I was like, I feel like such a loser for crying and like feeling things. And she was like, yeah, but Emily, like you're direct, you know, the way that you feel pain is the same way that you're going to feel joy. So you feel pain like a hundred times, but you're going to feel joy now like a hundred times. So if if that makes sense, it's like if we allow ourselves to really feel pain, then we can allow ourselves to really feel joy at the same time. I suppose you could say your emotions are more raw in a way. Yeah. Because you had them stripped back with the passing of your mother. Mm -hmm. You were forced in that two-year period to get really deep with your mother and talk about uncomfortable things we don't normally talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all the layers, like we're we're onions, aren't we? Yes. When I'm interviewing someone, I'm always like, this is an onion. I've got to peel away the layers. There's so many things, yeah. And uh, most people don't peel away the layers. Yeah. Especially like with their parents. You don't talk about things like death and stuff because it's... It's too sad. Yeah, it is. But when you're forced and the layers are gone, then mm-hmm. I suppose your feelings are more raw. Yeah. So you're going to feel things yeah. and more... And you're stripped back to like who you really are. Mm. So you're more vulnerable too in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you think your mother is now? She's everywhere. Like I feel like I will walk outside and like her spirit will be with me. And like if I go to like a rose garden like she's there or if I have a cup of coffee in the morning I feel like her like she's there you know 
how do you how do you know that because i just feel it i think that the mother child bond is like one of i think it's like an unbreakable bond that you probably one of the most unbreakable bonds in the world and i don't think that that bond ever leaves you do you think this is something that exists in your mind as a comfort mechanism or do you think that she is actually somewhere still existing in some way i think it's both i think it's both i look at certain events in my life and i'm like she was she was watching over me you know i was like there's no way to explain like certain things without there being some sort of spiritual metaphysical or whatever it is aspect but i truly honestly believe that she's she's around she's a very a very forceful woman she's around for people who are watching this now and they're thinking i would like to try what you're doing i want to go to italy or somewhere but i'm not sure or mm-hmm. this that what would you say to them do it if there's like something inside of you that says i want to do something then you should absolutely do it because i think the worst thing to do is to like look back at life and be like oh i wish i sorry i just wore i wish i did this i Mm. wish i did that i wish i had more time you know emily it's been a pleasure it's so much fun are we shaking hands i feel like my hand's sweaty from the tea it's okay (laughs) i will Except, wow, that it was a little bit clammy from because I was holding a mug of tea. That's, that was a very sweaty. Right. Hand. I know. God, that's embarrassing. Hey, it was great talking to you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for having me. It was honestly so much fun.